Okay, so welcome back everybody. We're going to start the cardiovascular system today. So talking about all the different components of the cardiovascular system this week. So today and Thursday, which is kind of a tall order actually. There's lots of fascinating things about the cardiovascular system. Um, so we'll do our best to hit kind of some of the most salient things and some of the high points. Uh, before we get too far into it though, just um, Yikes, right, with COVID, it's gotten um, really widespread, uh, which is not entirely surprising, especially given that in our off-campus students, we have people who have lots of roommates, and a lot of those roommates have boyfriends and girlfriends who they themselves have lots of roommates. So there's a lot of unmasked contact that really kind of couldn't be helped. Uh, so that's primarily where we're seeing most of the infections among stout students. Uh, but this rate of increase is quite something. So in the last week, we've had over 100 new cases, actually almost 200, so it's like 190 some new cases diagnosed in the county. So our contact tracers aren't able to keep up with that volume. So what that means is there's people who've potentially been exposed and there's a delay in them being notified that they've potentially been exposed. So now is the time to be really careful about masking, maintaining distance, not going out to bars and restaurants actually uh, would be super important right now so that we can hopefully try to flatten this a little bit because this is pretty scary looking. And it's true that most of our young adults who are getting sick with this, most of our students are doing just fine with it. They might feel lousy for a couple of days and then they're recovering. But you have to keep in mind, we do have students here who have significant cardiac problems, who have significant respiratory problems, who are on medicines that suppress their immune system. You may not know it, but they're here, okay? And those people are at really high risk of complications. And then, of course, you all don't just come to campus. You also go out to the community uh, where the people you're going to encounter are in large part older and not quite as healthy as you are, right? So we're concerned about our capacity to care for those folks if they develop uh, complications like me, right? Um, because we just have a little tiny hospital. So please do what you can. Right? Mask up, back up, wash up, that whole thing. Uh, to just keep your bubbles really small and to spend unmasked contact with as few people as possible it would be greatly appreciated. Any questions? Oh, I can't go backwards. Any questions about COVID? Yeah, Damon. Lacrosse is a mess. Yeah, lacrosse is seeing huge increases. They did a shelter in place order and it hasn't even really helped very much. I think it was a little too late. Um, so it's a good question. We're not doing better than Stephen's point necessarily. Um, and we're not doing better than Madison in terms of, Madison had an initial problem and then they got it under control. Um, but yeah, Eau Claire is having a real problem as well. So all these overlapping connections, right? People who have roommates, who have girlfriends, who have roommates, who have boyfriends, who have roommates, who have boyfriends. All right. So talking about the card. Oh, wait, any more questions about COVID before we start talking about cardiovascular system? Are you from Stevens Point? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of physicians at their student health center, and um, I'm, I'm just going to be quiet. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. So, cardiovascular system. So, the components are the heart, the blood vessels, and the blood itself. So, those are the things that we're going to be talking about this week. Today, we're going to start with the blood vessels and then talk about the heart. So, what are the functions of the cardiovascular system? We've learned about some of them already. What are some of the ways that it contributes to homeostasis? What are the, some of the things that we use our blood vessels to do? Uh, supply oxygen. Absolutely, it's gonna supply oxygen to the cells. Our cells are gonna use that up in the mitochondria as part of that process to make ATP. So cells need oxygen for their mitochondria to make ATP. The blood is going to deliver that oxygen to the cells. What else?
What's the waste product from making ATP? <sighs> yeah, carbon dioxide, right? So blood is going to deliver the oxygen, and it's going to take away the carbon dioxide. All right, so oxygen is needed for the mitochondria to make ATP. What's the other thing that's needed for the mitochondria to make ATP? Yeah, glucose, absolutely. So the bloodstream is also going to deliver glucose to the cells in our tissues. So we're going to talk a lot today about tissues, and by that I mean the dense regular connective tissue in my ligaments, the skeletal muscle tissue in my muscles, right? So when I say the tissues, I mean all the different body parts. So we'll use that language a lot today. We'll say we're delivering things to the tissues and taking things away from the tissues, right? We mean all of your body parts, right? All those areas of cells that are working together. So it's a transport system, primarily. So delivering oxygen, carrying away carbon dioxide. Delivering glucose, carrying away some other waste products, like lactic acid, for those of you who like to do an aerobic or anaerobic workout. What did we talk about that the blood vessels help do in the skin? Yeah, Lauren. Absolutely. So regulation of body temperature. So remember, the blood vessels in the skin will open up and dilate if we need to get rid of excess heat, and they will constrict and close down if we need to conserve heat and keep it in closer to our core. Right? So that's pretty cool. Let's see how we did. All right. So deliver nutrients and oxygen to the cells. Remove waste and carbon dioxide from the cells or the tissues. You can use either word interchangeably here. We're also going to do some stuff with the lungs that we'll get into next week when we do the respiratory system. It's going to help to maintain stable temperature, right, that we talked about, the, the blood vessels to the skin. It's also going to be an important contributor to maintaining a stable pH, right, that level of how acidic or alkaline our blood is, which is super important. All right, so this diagram, I just liked it. But, of course, usually arteries are shown in red, veins are shown in blue, and we have both on both sides of our body, okay? So I just don't want you to get confused and think you have arteries on the right side of your body and veins on the left, right? You have both on both sides. And so before we kind of get going, I want to show you, in general, arteries are colored red. We use the color red to denote oxygenated blood, so kind of fresh blood that's full of lots of oxygen to deliver to the tissues. Those blood vessels are going to be colored red. Blood vessels that are bringing kind of used up blood that doesn't have a lot of oxygen in it, those are going to be colored blue. Most of the time, arteries are red and veins are blue, but not always, as you'll see today. All right, so we're going to go in depth talking about the blood vessels. The first thing is that this is a one way system. Think of your blood vessels like the lanes on I 94, okay? If I'm in an artery, I can only go one way. If I'm on I-94 West, I can only go west. Okay, so it's really important to remember when we think about how blood gets to and from different parts of the body. This is a one-way system. The definition of an artery is that it is carrying blood that is moving away from the heart out to the tissues and cells. So that's the definition of an artery. Away from the heart to the tissues. In the tissues, we're going to find our smallest blood vessels, the capillaries. And then, moving back from the tissues to the heart are going to be the veins. So the definition of a vein is a blood vessel that carries blood to the heart, back to the heart. Arteries away from the heart, think A for away. Veins, back to the heart. Okay. So, arteries, blood away from the heart to the tissues. So again, it's a one-way system it's carrying the blood that's being pumped from the heart. This is a pretty high-pressure system. So our arteries have to have relatively thick walls that are durable and can withstand that pressure. Because if you feel your pulse, go ahead and take a moment. Feel your pulse in your neck. Every time you feel that little, mm, 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 
That is your artery going wong, 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 as a pressure wave of blood is pumped through it. That is a high pressure system. Okay, so we need thick enough walls to withstand that high pressure. We also need arteries to be customizable. We need to decide, you know what? I am digesting my lunch right now. So I need to send more blood to my intestines. So I need to be able to open up the arteries to my intestines. Or conversely, I'm working out right now or running away from a bear. So now is not a good time to exercise or to digest. So I'm going to send more blood to my muscles so I can run quickly and less blood to my intestines, right? So I need to be able to open up the blood vessels to my muscles, close down the blood vessels to my intestines. So it needs to be customizable. And so in order to achieve that, we're going to have a special tissue that you may recall located in the walls of our arteries, smooth muscle. Okay, so the smooth muscle is going to be run circumferentially, right? It encircles in that middle wall of the artery. So when that muscle con uh, contracts, it tightens down the artery. And when it relaxes, it opens up and dilates the artery. So when your skin gets flushed, because when you're hot, that's the smooth muscle relaxing, the artery opens up, more blood flow goes to that area of your body. So arteries are really cool looking. From the arteries then, they're going to branch out like branches of a tree into smaller arteries, which we call arterioles, which is just kind of a cute name. So arterioles are just mini arteries, right? So as the arteries branch out to reach all the different parts of our body, So here's an artery, branches into multiple different arterioles. And then as we follow that out, we're going to get to the capillaries. So the capillaries are the smallest blood vessel, and they are throughout almost all of our tissues. There are very few tissues in our body that don't have capillaries in them. Can you think of one place where we don't have capillaries? It's a part of your body that's clear. Ethan. Ah, your earlobes. So your earlobes are made of that hyaline cartilage, and they don't have very many capillaries because they don't bleed very much generally. So they don't have very many. They do have some, but not very many. What's a clear part of your body? Yeah. Yeah, so the cornea, right? This front surface of your eyeball. No capillaries because then we'd be seeing red all the time, <laughs> okay? So, but most tissues have this network of the tiniest blood vessels. It's often referred to as the capillary bed, but it's this whole branching network of these tiniest little blood vessels. And this is where that delivery mechanism, that transport mechanism of the circulatory system is really going to happen. So when we look at the structure of a capillary, it is made specifically to allow this to happen. It's made of our old friend, simple squamous epithelium. So when you look at the wall of a capillary, it is just one cell layer thick. So here's a squamous cell, here's a squamous cell. Remember, they're tightly packed. So remember how we saw that sheet of simple squamous epithelium? Imagine that sheet, and now you just curve it around and do a tube. So it's one cell layer thick and a very skinny, thin cell at that. So that's on purpose because if I need things to be able to move from in the blood out into the tissues or from the tissues back into the blood, I want easy, rapid diffusion. Right? So remember, oh my gosh, it's coming back to haunt us. Diffusion, right? So that's movement of a solute from an area of high concentration to low concentration. So as that fresh oxygen-rich arterial blood comes into the tissues through the capillary, it has a lot of oxygen in it. It has more oxygen in it than the tissues do because they've been using it up to make ATP in their mitochondria. So therefore, oxygen will move out of the blood and into the tissues, which is where we need it. Score. 
carbon dioxide, which is being produced as a waste product out in the tissues, much higher concentration out here than in there, it's going to move in. So I think I have another slide on that. So before we kind of talk about that a second, this is a microscopic image of a capillary. Here's the little thin walls. These happen to be skeletal muscle cells on either side, recognizable because of their striations or stripes. You might remember that. This is a red blood cell. There's actually two right next to each other. So you can see these are tiny, tiny, tiny little blood vessels. The red blood cells can barely squeeze through. Right? They're teeny. All right. So we talked about this is where the exchange is going to happen. This is where diffusion is happening. So oxygen, as we talked about, is going to move out of the bloodstream into the tissues, into the body cells in the tissues. Nutrients like glucose are also going to move out of the bloodstream and into the tissues. Carbon dioxide is going to move from the tissues into the bloodstream. And any other waste products are going to move from the tissues into the blood inside the capillary. So that thin wall allows for rapid, easy diffusion down the concentration gradient. Okay. So as we travel through the capillary bed, oxygen is moving out of the blood. So now we're going to start coloring our blood vessels blue because now it's deoxygenated blood low in oxygen. All right, so now we need to kind of get back to the heart so we can do this all over again. So from the capillary, the blood is then going to move into a small vein called a venule. So our mini arteries were arterioles, our mini veins are venules. And then those are going to dump the blood into the vein, and then the blood is going to move back to the heart. So we have all these veins everywhere, right, so that we can take blood from the tissues, from the blood in the capillaries, can drain into venules and then vein. And then it's got to go all the way back up here to the heart. We call that venous return. I don't have little tiny hearts in my toes. <laughs> that would be kind of crazy if I did. So how is the blood in my vein getting all the way back up to my heart. What do you think? Lauren. Good. So there's going to be some blood pressure here, right? This is a continuous circuit. It's a one-way path. So is there some pressure coming, you know, from the arterial side through the capillaries to kind of hitch in my get along on the venous side? There's a little bit, but it's actually very low. So it alone is not enough to counteract gravity. All right, so if I had no other way to get venous blood back, I would have to like periodically like, you know, <laughs> drain the blood out of my toes. Right, to get it back to the heart. Huh. So this is a problem. Thankfully, we have two mechanisms that help move blood through the veins back to the heart. Okay. Two. And they rely on an important structural component of veins, which are valves. So valve, or excuse me, veins have relatively thin walls, not as thin as capillaries, not at all, but relatively thin, and they have these valves in them. Valves are like one-way doors. So blood can go this way, but if it tries to come back this way, it's going to get stuck in here in the valve. So this is um, a vein that they've opened up in the operating room. And it's very thin and filmy and delicate. I'm not sure that you can really see, but there's one side of the valve. Here's the other side of the valve here. So valves are going to prevent backward flow. So that's going to be really useful for us. So we're going to take a little break and watch the YouTube video so that you can actually play with your own valves of your veins. All right. And we're recording. OK. So gravity doesn't work all that well unless we kind of do cartwheels a lot. <laughs> 
And the blood pressure only contributes a little tiny bit. So we have these two other mechanisms, the skeletal muscle pump and the respiratory pump. And we're going to talk about them one at a time. So the skeletal muscle pump, when we do muscles later, you'll learn about how when you contract a muscle, it gets fatter. You know this already from when you like make a muscle, right? And it gets fatter, right? Now when that happens, it's going to push on the veins that are traveling in that area and squish the blood, which can only go one way because of the valves. So every time your muscles contract, they're squishing blood back up toward your heart. And then when the muscles relax, the blood can't fall back past the valves. So this is called the skeletal muscle pump. And this is the reason why if somebody's going on like a really long plane flight or a really long car trip or something, you might have seen that there's like, oh, do some exercises of your leg to help your circulation. That's what that's for. If you don't move your legs at all, blood just sits there and it can clot and cause problems, right? <laughs> blood needs to keep flowing. So that's the skeletal muscle pump. It's happening constantly, all the time. Right? And you might be like, well, I'm just sitting here. I'm not contracting my legs very much. Well, you do, actually. We constantly have this thing called resting tone. So we're constantly making little tiny contractions in our muscles um, most of the time. So skeletal muscle pump. And then the other one is the respiratory pump. So it just so happens that the way we pull air into our lungs when we take a deep breath in, is that our diaphragm, this muscle that comes across the middle, pushes down and acts like the plunger on a syringe, creates suction. So it creates negative pressure or suction inside our chest cavity. That pulls air into our lungs, but it also pulls blood in through our veins into the heart. So that's called the respiratory pump. So the respiratory pump is when that negative pressure that's generated during inhalation pulls blood through the veins toward the heart. So we have a little bit of blood pressure. Sometimes we get some help from gravity. And then we have the skeletal muscle pump and the respiratory pump with the help of those really thin walls that make veins compressible and the valves to prevent backward flow. All right, so veins are not without their problems. Arteries too, but we'll talk about those next time. Right, so what happens if your veins aren't doing a good job? If your valves are leaky, right? So healthy vein, blood can go this way, but if it tries to go backwards, the valve is gonna close. If you have a dilated vein with a leaky valve, it's gonna get big and bulge out, and that's what causes varicose veins. So a varicose vein is when you have a big dilated vein because of leaky valves. So you might be like, well, what causes that? One of the things that can cause that is back pressure on the blood in the veins. So this is why people are told not to sit with their legs crossed, because that puts a lot of pressure on those veins in your legs. Right? That's also why we tend to see this a lot in the calves. It's part of the reason why. Right? You want to be nice to your veins. Another problem that I kind of alluded to earlier that can happen with veins is if that blood just sits around because you really aren't moving your muscles at all, so that skeletal muscle pump is not really mobilizing that blood out of your vein, if blood sits around for a long time, what it tends to do, whether it's in a vein or in a test tube, is it tends to clot. And so if it forms a clot, that is called a thrombosis. So a DVT stands for deep vein thrombosis. Perhaps you've heard of those. That in and of itself can cause pain and swelling in the affected area. It's usually not particularly dangerous, but can be very uncomfortable. But the dangerous thing that can happen is if a piece of that breaks off, it can then travel through your circulatory system, through your blood vessels, and ending up lodging in your lungs, 
for your brain. And there it can cause problems because it blocks blood flow. So if you've ever heard of a pulmonary embolus or a PE, which is actually one of the few medical problems that kills people your age, in general, that's what that is. So it's important to move around periodically. These are really common in people after they've had knee surgery, for example. So sometimes we'll even put people on blood thinning medicine to prevent clots if they've had a knee surgery. Big problem. All right, so blood vessels are a one-way system. From the heart, blood moves into arteries, then mini arteries called arterioles, then capillaries where the diffusion happens, then into mini veins called venules, then into veins and back to the heart. So our arteries have those thick walls with smooth muscle in them so that they're customizable and they can withstand high pressures. Our capillaries have that simple squamous epithelium to allow for rapid and easy diffusion of nutrients, gases, and wastes. And our veins have relatively thin walls with valves to enable the skeletal muscle pump. And then we also have the respiratory pump to move blood back to the heart. So, now, okay, so what's going to move the blood through the blood vessels is, of course, going to be the heart on the arterial side. On the venous side, we have the skeletal muscle pump, respiratory pump, and all that jazz. So what does the heart do? I just said. What does it do? It pumps the blood. The other thing that the heart does, which does not get nearly enough credit for, is it relaxes and fills with blood. So just keep that in mind. It will be important later. So you have to pump it out, and then you have to relax and open up and fill with blood in order to be a good, healthy, effective heart. All right, so it's going to pump blood out, and it's going to receive blood back. Otherwise, it would quickly run out of anything to pump. So the blood is going to go to and from all the tissues in the body. And that's what we've been talking about thus far, right? Out away from the heart through the arteries, then arterioles into the capillaries where the exchange is going to happen, then venules and veins, and then back toward the heart. But then there's this, where does it actually get the oxygen from? This is not a trick question. Where does the blood get the oxygen from? Yeah, from the lungs, right? So it's like, oh, we, get, we, have to also, we also have to send blood to the lungs to get oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide. So we have to send blood to the body and back, and we have to send the blood to and from the lungs. So those are two separate jobs that the heart has to do. And I want to make sure that I don't send any blood out to the body that hasn't just come from the lungs, because then what's the point? There's no oxygen in it, right? So I actually want to have a continuous circuit and a double pump. One pump is sending blood out to the lungs. The other one is sending it out to the tissues. And you can't get into one unless you've gone through the other one first. So that's why the heart gets a little confusing. <laughs> so we talked about how blood leaves the heart through arteries and arterioles to get to the capillaries out in the tissues where we're going to deliver oxygen. Then we're going to come back through veins. And it just so happens the part of the heart that's going to pump out the oxygenated blood is the left side of the heart. That is the patient's left. Mm -hmm. So that's the other confusing thing. When you look at diagrams, the left side of the heart is on the right side of the page. Because in anatomy, whenever we draw something, we're imagining that we're looking at a person who is facing us. We are looking at a patient who is facing us. So this side is their left side. This side is their right side. So after it comes back from the body and is deoxygenated blue blood, it's going to come into the right side of the heart, which will then pump it to the lungs so it can get rid of the carbon dioxide to pick up oxygen. And then it will come back to the left side of the heart. So this is a continuous circuit with two different pumps. Sometimes 
This part from here to here is called the pulmonary circuit because pulmonary means of the lungs. And this part out here is called the systemic circuit because it's kind of going to the whole rest of the system. Okay. So we have these kind of two different things that are happening side by side and in conjunction with each other. So let's take a look at how this is going to start. So we're going to start with oxygen-rich, fresh, awesome blood. And so we're in the left ventricle. So again, this is the patient's left side. This is the patient's right side. So we're going to start in the left ventricle. The ventricles are the lower parts of the heart that do the pumping out to either the body or the lungs. Right? They're the big pumps. So the left ventricle then is going to pump blood out through this massive, massive artery called the aorta. It's the one big exit door out of the left ventricle. It's literally this big around. I should bring one to class. It would drip all over the place, but maybe I'll bring one. Okay. So it's going to pump nice, fresh, oxygenated blood out through the aorta to all of the arteries of the body that they're then going to branch into arterioles and out into the capillaries. So from that left ventricle out through the aorta and into all the arteries that go to all the different parts of our body, out into the capillaries, fresh oxygenated blood. So gets out to wherever it's going, all the places that it has to go. Then we're going to get to the capillaries, right? And we're going to exchange our gases and our nutrients and our wastes, just like we talked about before. So we're going to do the capillary thing. And you know what comes next, venules and veins. So we're going to get back now to the heart through the veins via the skeletal muscle pump and respiratory pump, thanks to the thin walls and the valves. Then as we're coming back to the heart, we're now going to enter the right side of the heart. We're going to get there through two major veins. So there's two big, huge veins that are going to empty in to the right atrium here. This one up here, which is collecting blood from the head, the neck, and the upper extremities, is the superior vena cava, or the SVC. This one down here, which is bringing all the blood from the abdominal cavity, the pelvis, and the lower extremities is the inferior vena cava, or the IVC. So both of those huge veins are bringing all the venous used up blood from the body now into the right side of the heart, specifically the right atrium. So the word atrium actually kind of comes from architecture. It's another word for like a lobby. It's a receiving area. So you know like Jarvis Hall where you first come in and there's like the food cart and stuff. That's called the atrium. It's the place you first come into. So we talked about how the ventricles are the strong pumps. The atria are the receiving areas. So this venous blood is going to come into the right atrium. Then it's going to move through a valve called the tricuspid valve because it has three flaps on it. So remember, a valve is a one-way door, so it allows the blood to move this way into the right ventricle. There we go. So from the right atrium into the right ventricle, we have the tricuspid valve that will prevent the blood from trying to go backwards. From the right ventricle now, the right ventricle is going to contract and pump blood out. Can't go this way because the valve's going to close. So it's going to go through this one-way door, which is called the pulmonary valve, into this structure, which I've starred, which is called the pulmonary trunk. So pulmonary means of the lung. Trunk means it's like a big artery that's going to split. Now I just said artery, and it's blue. Right? Yeah, you have to be careful with the pulmonary vessels. This is deoxygenated venous blood that came from the body, but it's moving away from the heart. So because it's moving out of the heart, it's an artery, but because it's deoxygenated blood, it's blue. So the pulmonary vessels are always going to be opposite of what you typically see. 
So then from the pulmonary trunk out into the pulmonary arteries, one's going to go to the left lung, one's going to go to the right lung. Here's what that looks like. So moving out through those pulmonary arteries are blue, out into all the different parts of the lung to get rid of carbon dioxide and pick up oxygen. Then we have to get back. So we get back to the heart through, oops, yep, CO2 is released and oxygen is obtained. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We get back to the heart through veins. Okay, so once we pick up the oxygen, now we're red blood, but we're going to move back through these veins. So the pulmonary veins are red. And then that oxygenated, freshly oxygenated blood is going to come into the side of the heart that deals with oxygenated blood, which is the left side. So it's going to enter the left atrium here. Then it's going to move through the left atrium into the left ventricle, another valve. This one is called the bicuspid or mitral valve. Because somebody thought it looked like a bishop's mitre. You know the movie The Princess Bride? Yes, some of you seen it together, just nailage <laughs> and that funny hat he wears. They thought that that was what this valve looked like, so they named it after a bishop's mitre, which is the hat. So it's the mitral valve or the bicuspid because it has two flaps. You can use either term to prevent backflow. And now we're back in the left ventricle. So from here again, the ventricle is going to contract and send this freshly oxygenated blood out the aorta through the arteries to the entire body. It's pretty cool. So, doing it like this is kind of eh. So let's watch a video. All right, so now we're going to talk about regulation of the heart and how we make this happen in a synchronized way, right? This has to be coordinated. So we're going to have a whole system that allows us to coordinate how blood moves through the heart. The first thing that needs to happen is those atria. Those right, with the deoxygenated blood and left atria, need to squeeze their blood down into the ventricles. Okay? So they've received the blood from either the lungs or the body. They need to squeeze it down into the ventricles. So the first thing that needs to happen is atrial contraction. And then we need to give it a minute. We need to let that blood fill the ventricles fully. Right? We can't have the atria and ventricles contracting at the same time. Right? We need to give a little moment so the ventricles can completely fill, so that then the ventricles can contract and pump and squeeze and push the blood out. So we need a system to coordinate it so that the atria contracts, there's a little tiny pause, and then the ventricles contract. We also need to make sure, gosh, who do you think has the harder job, the atria or the ventricles? You're like in a food coma from lunch. <laughs> so the atria, when you think about it, they just have to push the blood into the ventricles, which are right next door. So they actually have the easier job. The ventricles have to push the blood forcefully, especially in case of the left side, to get all the way out to my toes, right? Or all the way up to my fingertips, even if I'm holding my arm above my head. So you have to get a lot of pressure. So that's also going to play a role here in how the system's designed. So that first thing that needs to happen is atrial contraction. The way that happens is there's a special area up in the right atrium called the SA node, which stands for sinoatrial node. So the SA node. And it's this really weird kind of tissue. It's part cardiac muscle and it's part nervous system. It's weird tissue. And the SA node will send an electrical signal out periodically, about 70 times per minute, unless it's told to do otherwise. Right? I could pluck your heart out of your body, stick it in a Petri dish, and your SA node would send a signal about 70 times a minute. What happens to that electrical signal then is it's going to travel like a wave not like a wave at the ocean, but like a wave at a stadium <laughs> through all the cardiac muscle cells in the atria. And as that electrical signal hits each of those cardiac cells, they contract. 
So what happens for atrial contraction is we get this slow, gradual progression of a signal to contract that just kind of goes and goes wave-like through the atria on both sides. So it's just kind of Right? It's like the little people ringing the bell at a show after intermission. It's like, time to go into the theater now. Right? It's very gentle, gradual. Yeah. Um, so I just had a question related to like, circulation. Yeah. So like, a lot of people will say, like, oh, I have really bad circulation. I see fingers are over the cold. Does that mean that their ventricle then is just like, not strong? Or? Oh, so that's a really good question. So the question is, people who say they have bad circulation, their hands and feet are always cold, does that mean their ventricles aren't as strong? Usually it means that those blood vessels tend to be constricted a lot of the time. And that can be for a lot of different reasons. So it can be because of some problems with the arteries themselves. It can be from what we would call relative energy deficiency. So if somebody's body is trying to conserve energy and calories, because maybe they're dieting or they don't eat enough or they exercise too much, their body will do that too. There's a bunch of things that can cause it. But it doesn't have to do with the ventricles usually. Good question. All right. So this SA node is going to send that electrical signal that moves from cardiac muscle cell to cardiac muscle cell to cardiac muscle cell, and we get a wah kind of contraction. Then, oh yeah, we're going to give it a minute. Yes. Yeah. It just goes through the atria. And now, there's no reason necessarily why these cells wouldn't also respond, except there's these valves in between, right? There's kind of a break in the chain of, of muscle cells. So where it does go, however, is it goes to this next site in what's called our conduction system, the AV node, named because it's right between the atria and the ventricles. <laughs> no mystery there. So it's going to go to the AV node. And as soon as the AV node receives that signal, it's going to go, wait for it. Wait for it, wait for it. Wait. OK, but all right, so the AV node is going to pause the signal for a minute. It's not going to let it go through the rest of the system. We're going to wait so that the blood can fill the ventricles fully. Then when it's showtime, then it's like shabam. So once the AV node has decided it's been long enough, it is going to send its signal through this highly specialized network of this weird pseudo-nervous pseudo-muscular tissue. So we were fine with the atria just going wah, right? That was fine. But for the ventricles, I don't want this muscle cell and then this muscle cell and then this muscle cell and then this muscle cell to gradually contract. I need to generate a lot of force. I need everybody to go all at once and all together, right? Because I really need to generate some velocity here. So in order to enable that to happen, this is like a wiring system. So the signal is going to go from the AV node through what's called the AV bundle. It's going to divide into the right and left bundles, and then send out these little tiny branches called Purkinje fibers, which is a great word and excellent computer password. So this special wiring is going to allow that signal to travel so quickly that it arrives at almost every single cardiac muscle cell at the same time. So we get a huge, coordinated, all-at-once contraction. So that's why we have all this wiring down here, but we don't up here. So this is what we see when we look at an EKG. So when I do an EKG on a patient, I put little electrodes hooked to wires and various parts on their chest and their arms and their legs, and then I get a readout. I am not giving them electricity, <laughs> right? Not for that. What I'm doing is I am reading the actual electrical activity of the heart. Like, it is truly electrical activity. It's in milliamps. You can measure it, right? There's actual electrical current flowing through your heart right at this very moment. It's kind of crazy to think about. So what those electrodes do is they just sense those electrical signals. 
So if I break it down to each individual heartbeat, looking at an EKG, we'll see there are three main parts that I want you to know about. This first part here, this initial deflection, this is your SA node sending an electro electrical signal that's moving through the atria. So that's the atrial contraction right there. That's called the P wave. I don't know why they picked P. It's the P wave on an EKG. Then the AV node says, wait for it. And we have a brief pause. Then once the AV node is ready, shabam! We're going to send down through the AV bundle, the right and left bundle, and the Purkinje fibers. And that's the QRX complex. This is the ventricular contraction. So that's what we're seeing when we look at an EKG, which is really crazy and cool. You might be like, what's this over here? <laughs> this is the reset. So after muscles contract, they have to reset everything in order to be able to contract again. That is the reset. It's called repolarization. So when we look at an EKG, each one of these is a heartbeat. Atria ventricles, reset. Atria ventricles, reset. Atria ventricles, reset. Atria ventricles. You get the point. Right? So that's happening right now in every single one of you. What questions do you have? Yeah. Ah, so what if there's an irregular heartbeat? See, darn, I should have, I thought about putting some in here and I didn't because I didn't think we were going to have time. But we do have time. So irregular heartbeats can be caused by a couple of different things. Sometimes your SA node, like, tries to do a little syncopation, <laughs> right? So sometimes your SA node, instead of just being boring, tonk, 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 right? Sometimes it'll be like, tonk, 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 right? So it might have a little hitch that's get along. The other thing that can happen is sometimes the AV node is like, I don't want to have to follow your instructions. I'm sick of taking orders for you. I'm just going to do what I want. <laughs> And sometimes the AV node will send its own signal without being prompted by the SA node first. And then some other times, the ventricles are just like, you know, nobody appreciates us. <laughs> and they do what's called a premature ventricular contraction. And they're like, you know, we're just going to contract. I know you didn't tell us, but we're just going to do it anyway. So it's, there's all kinds of different heart rhythm problems that can happen. And we can often, because a problem with the heart rhythm is a problem with the electrical conduction system, we can diagnose those almost all the time if we catch them in the moment on an EKG, which is really fun and totally nerdy, and I love it. Yes? So, repeat thinner, like those, I don't entirely understand, but I assume it then regulates the electrical. So, pacemakers are fascinating. So, pacemakers, we are literally giving a small electrical signal to the heart every so often a tiny shock. So a pacemaker is a battery controlled device that has a wire leading out from it. And so the wire is actually, so the device, they put it underneath your skin, so it's like entirely inside of you. And then the wire runs into your heart, usually into that right atrium where the SA node is. And what it will do is they can program it and say, okay, we need you to beat 80 times a minute. And 80 times a minute, that little pacemaker will go zap zap, zap, and that electrical signal, because it is electricity after all, will propagate through the age, gets the AV node, who waits for it, and then sends it down the rest of the heart, and then the ventricles contract. Super cool. Yeah? I couldn't hear you, Lauren. I'm sorry. The newest Apple Watch can do it, yeah. I mean, it's amazing what you can do. You don't have to have a lot of highfalutin stuff to be able to actually measure this electrical output that's happening. It helps sometimes. You get better resolution, better quality. But yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. Yeah, Ethan. 
Oh, that's a really good question. How do you die if you have a pacemaker? And it's making your heart beat. Well, that's a really good question. So then the question becomes, what happens when you die? Like, what actually is happening when you die? <laughs> is it that your heart stops beating? Or is it that you stop breathing? Or is it that you stop having brain activity? It could be any one of those things. But so you're right, in people who have a pacemaker who die, their heart, unless their heart muscle is really sick for some other reason and can't respond to the signal, their heart will keep pumping for a period of time. Now, if they're not breathing, which is usually the case, they're not breathing, eventually all the oxygen's going to get used up. Right? So the blood may be circulating, but there's not new oxygen coming in through the lungs. So if that happens, eventually none of the cells are getting any oxygen. Mitochondria can't make ATP. They can't make ATP. The cells die. So what will happen eventually over the course of several minutes is that the heart cells will die from lack of oxygen, and then it will stop beating. Mm -hmm. um, so you also said, like, battery control? Yes. Battery power, so yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so one time we, um, so, uh, so pacemakers are fascinating for many reasons. And some pacemakers are actually not even just pacemakers, but also defibrillators. So you know, like in TV shows and stuff, when they're like clear, and they're like, right, when somebody like dies or something. So that's called a defibrillation. Why would we ever do that? Whoever came up with the idea, I have no idea, right? That took balls, right? So, but so what can happen sometimes if you don't do that reset properly, if you don't do that and you try to have a beat right here, what happens is all your cardiac muscle gets out of sync and your heart muscle, your ventricles, instead of going whoosh, like that and pumping the blood out, they go like this. It looks like a bag of worms. It's called ventricular fibrillation and the electrical signal is just bouncing around all over the place. Obviously, if you're going like this, you're not pumping blood anywhere, right? This is a life-threatening emergency. So what we do, put the paddles on, deliver a shock, it's like a reset button, right? It's like turning it off and turning it on with your computer, right? It's like, okay, we're going to depolarize all the cells at once, and then you'll all come back online, and then usually, often, if whatever caused the defibrillation is no longer happening, then the heart can come back. So I can't remember what the question was exactly. I got all excited and talked about defibrillation. I was just asking if it still goes after Because, like, if there's, nothing, if there's nothing with the pacemaker that, like, says, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I was talking about pacemakers. So sometimes people have heart conditions where their hearts go into ventricular fibrillation, like, not infrequently. And if that happens when you're not in a hospital, that's a problem. So some people's pacemaker is not just a pacemaker, it's also a defibrillator. So it also has wires in that go to the ventricles that will deliver a bigger shock if your heart goes into fibrillation. So I also teach the cadaver dissection course here. And so one year we had a cadaver, and it's not uncommon that we have a cadaver that has a pacemaker. So we had one, and I was like, gosh, I'm not sure that that's a plain pacemaker, right? And so, and, and they're still active. They're still going. They still have battery power. And so I called up the device company right off the serial number. They said, oh, yeah, that's a defibrillator. So I was so glad we didn't cut through the wire, right? Because it was a big shock. So they're, it's interesting how they're made. They're made so that if you put some really big magnets over top of them, it shuts them off. So we had to put really big magnets over top of it, and then we were able to clip the wires and remove it. A little excitement. But yes, and sometimes they malfunction, and they keep shocking somebody, which is also really unfortunate. Very uncomfortable. That happens. 
Other questions about the heart and the conduction system? We'll get into that next time. <laughs> Good? All right. I think we're done a little early today. You've deserved it. Have a good couple of days. I'll see you Thursday. Stay safe, please.